Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Dr. David Wild, Vice President of Performance Improvement here at the University of Kansas Health System in for Dr. Steve Stites this morning. We're coming to you from the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. And today, a special guest with us all the way from Arizona, Dr. Vince Key, the head team physician for the Royals, uh, an orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine specialist here at the health system, is at training camp. He'll join us in a bit to talk about uh, spring training during a pandemic, what looks different this year uh, besides Carlos Santana. Uh, but first, Dr. Uh, Dana Hawkinson, our medical director of infection prevention and control is here with our numbers. Dana, how do we do overnight? You know, we did pretty good. You know, Vince is out in Arizona. I think he should have helped uh, Tiger. <laughs> it's, a, it's a quick quick trip to quick LA, drive. so he would have been been very helpful for that. You know, uh, we're doing pretty good. Um, got kind of concerned early in the week when our acute numbers had gone up. Acute numbers today, 23 active infections, which I think is astounding. Uh, 10 of those, though, are in the ICU, so almost half, but only two on the ventilator, so that's a good thing. 32 in that recovery period, so I, I think we're doing pretty well overall, 55 total patients. Hayes is doing pretty well as well, 13 total patients with eight in the active uh, phase and five in the recovery, so... Overall, too, I saw um, in Kansas City um, from yesterday's data in the Kansas City Star, felt just under 200 cases per day for the rolling seven-day average. So, you know, again, I think as a, as a community, we, we have done pretty good and been very fortunate compared to some of the other cities in the nation. Yeah, very true. Well, before we jump too much into our discussion today, Jessica, are there any reporter questions on the line this morning? We're checking right now. Go ahead with your question. No reporter questions. It's all you. Very good. Well, let's move right to uh, Dr. Key. How is Arizona this morning? It's warm. Mm, it's warm. <laughs> it's 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 not bad. Hey, Dana. I I know uh, you you mentioned Tiger. It's funny because where he was taken initially was Harbor UCLA. It's actually right down the street from where I trained in LA. So. Um, and then he got transferred over to Cedars uh, yesterday. So that's where two of my kids were born. And actually, the chief of trauma there uh, actually was a resident one or two years behind me. So wow. um, for his initial injury, he got treated where he needed to be treated because Harbor is a county uh, a level one trauma center, mm -hmm. one of the best around in L.A. So. Um, once he got stabilized, then he can go over. I call Cedar Sinai the country club, so he can go over to the country <laughs> club and convalesce. So, um, but anyway, you know, uh, Arizona's good. Um, everything is ready to roll. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different here uh, with COVID. Uh, the way that we do things, we really uh, try to uh, be really proactive in terms of what we've done. We've been preparing for this um since the end of the season so um through major league baseball we've been trying to uh see how uh spring training is going to look like um we're trying to see uh even how the season's going to look so uh there are a lot of things that are uh a little bit different we are definitely social distancing um even the way we eat usually we ate inside now we eat outside the tables are spread apart um, we get tested every other day. In fact, I have to get tested today. Um, we even have our little monitors. Those just came in. So uh, we'll have monitors on the players, monitors on the staff. Uh, so I think we're doing everything right here. You know, Vince, uh, there have been some pictures that have shown things uh, being very different, uh, like weight rooms being moved outside where possible and the use of uh, really every field for stretching and no minor league players, and so using really uh, multiple clubhouses to spread the team out. Those are the things that were easily seen visually, sort of in the, in the paper or uh, online. What, what other sorts of things, you know, you mentioned the eating, for example, what other, other sorts of things outside of masking and physical distancing are, are noticeably different uh, in Surprise this year? Well, it is. It's, it's even we have rehab up on the upper fields in a covered environment. Since it's, it's so warm here, we're doing some PT outside. Um, you're right in terms of the weight room, but the, the way that weight room is set up, it's actually been set up for that all along. 
It's just the fact that now we're using it. Um, you know, coming in and out, like you said, we're using the minor league and major league side. The minor leaguers won't come in until the first week in April. So spring training is going to be longer. It's usually six weeks. Now it's going to be six weeks for the major league guys and then four weeks for the minor league guys. So it's a total of uh, 10 weeks. And normally uh, spring training is sort of a, a almost a pilgrimage. You get a lot of media and a lot of spectators. Is that the same this year? No, not at all. I, we only have, I think, uh, two reporters from the star that we've even seen. Um, so in talking to Mike Swanson, our VP of media, you know, there's, there's really no media here outside of those guys with the Kansas City Star. Usually we'll have ESPN come in, Major League Network come in, uh, you know, so, but there's none of that here. So all of it is via Zoom, Skype, or whatever platform that they have. And as we get closer to game time, do you have an idea of what will be different uh, for the players and, and really around uh, the ballpark this year as the season progresses? I think it'll be, uh, hopefully, in terms of, obviously, fans being allowed in. Um, hopefully, that's going to be the case. I know out here, uh, they had Kansas State playing baseball out here uh, in a tournament at using our stadium, and uh, we had fans there. We had the parents out there. Um, I know during the minor league, ga I mean, the games out here in spring training, they're going to have, I think, about 20 to 25 percent of fans. Uh, they'll be all spread out. Um, so that'll be good. And I think that that will manif hopefully manifest itself uh, to the regular season. Um, everything else is pretty much uh, what we went through last year. Like I said, the template that Major League Baseball uh, set for us to, to even get us through the season last year is pretty much the same. Um, there are some little tweaks here and there, but uh, overall it's, it's pretty much the same. You know, you mentioned um, every other day testing, a lot of the other things that, that look different for the, the staff and the team. If I remember right, we had really a week or so, maybe two weeks of spring training last year, and then everything mm -hmm. kind of halted. So this is, this is really new. All of this is new in spring training. What we learned during the season last year might be applied, but this is, this is all the first time for the teams while they're, they're preparing for the season, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it, is, it is new for them. Again, it's new how they prepare to come into spring training. A lot of guys prepare a little bit differently. It's going to be a little bit different ramp up. Um, I think it's good in the sense that you don't have a ton of baseball players here. Uh, so there's a little bit more emphasis one-on-one -on -one time with players and coaches. Um, on the medical staff side, it's been pretty much the same. I mean, uh, it, it was, at least for me, it was less physicals that I had to do initially. Um, but just because of uh, everything that went down, uh, went down in Texas with the snow and everything, I actually had to do physicals for the Texas Rangers next door. So, you know, that was the only thing that was a little bit different for me, uh, that I had to do physicals. Uh, I was a team doc for both teams there for, uh, for about a day or two. Interesting. Yeah, the curveballs of this year continue, don't they? I mean, the weather <laughs> on top of, of everything else. So the, the real important questions, um, what do you think about the team as things are shaping up? Here's what I'll say. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different energy this year. Um, uh, the one guy we miss is the guy over my shoulder, Alex Gordon. Um, Alex and I have texted a few times. I told him I missed him. Uh, I miss his little, he has uh, a little bench or his locker. I think Whit Merrifield has his locker now. Um, but uh, it, it, the energy is different. I remember Nicky Lopez coming into the training room and he said, there's a little bit more juice this year. And uh, I think it's a good mix of uh, old and new. Um, it's almost like getting the band back together again with Mike Miner and Wade Davis and Greg Holland back and, you know, we have some of the guys back from uh, 14 and 15 to be able to blend with the uh, with the Brady Singers and the, and the Boo Bitches and the, uh, guys like that. So um, and then we get the addition of uh, someone like Carlos Santana. So you, we would much rather him on our team than playing against him, uh, given the fact that every time he played in Kauffman Stadium, he hit about two or three bombs a game. 
Um, but we, we've added some new pieces. Uh, Michael Taylor out in center field. Um, uh, you know, Ben Attendee from the, from the Red Sox. So um, we've added some nice pieces. And I think, hopefully, I think we're going to be a little bit better than most people think. Um, I'm no prognosticator saying we're going to make the playoffs or anything like that. But it is a little bit different energy this year. Uh, this is my 11th season taking care of the team. Um, but it's a little bit different energy this year than it has been the past uh, couple of years. I think it's, it's good to hear that from the outside watching. It sure looks like the sort of mm -hmm. stability now with Santana being at first base and allowing the lineup to really be set. Um, some of the other additions you mentioned, having center field really covered with Taylor. And, Lots of things seem to be falling in line as uh, as the sun is uh, <laughs> creating evidence. Yeah, the sun's you, killing me. <laughs> it's going to be a nice front light, though, once it comes down. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll give you a break for just a second. Yeah, we'll get to some community questions. I'm sure uh, there'll be some things that we'll, we'll toss your way. But, Jessica? Are you growing a beard, by the way? A little bit. Okay, yeah. that was my question well, of the there day. There you go. Looking good. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Awkward. So first question uh, is: My family had COVID and at Thanksgiving time. Do we have immunity now? Dana, you want to start? Still. Yeah, and certainly you can pick up. Um, I would say there's probably partial Im immunity. We don't know to what extent. You know what we're learning more and more is that with cases of mild to moderate disease, um, you probably don't have uh, as much as Im immunity. Um, but what does that mean? Is that T cell response, is that antibodies? There's pretty good studies showing that if you have more severe disease, you typically have higher antibody levels. What is the relationship of that? What does that mean? Uh, we don't really know. Still, the guidance is that, you know, if you've had COVID-19, you should probably still have immunity for at least 90 days. Now, what does that immunity mean? Uh, there was just an article published um, recently in MMWR, I think, that looked at reinfections in a nursing home. Um, but this was several months out. This was a lot longer than 90 days. So um, to a short answer to that question is you probably do have some immunity, but we don't know what level of immunity that is, and we still don't know what happens uh, if you get reinfection on the individual level. Um, so we are still learning that. Now that county health departments have control of the vaccine and will only let hospitals vaccinate people living in their specific counties, is this going to slow down the access to the vaccine? What happened to go anywhere and get your shot? So lots of questions in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think realistically, one of the things that we've learned to be really comfortable with over the last year is that uh, the story today isn't the story tomorrow. And the current situation where counties are receiving uh, allocations and, and then trying to figure out how best to manage getting those doses into the residents in that county um, is, is really a function of the fact that inventory or supply is, is a challenge. And I think once that goes away, as we um, get more doses flowing into the United States, as manufacturers ramp up, as we get a, uh, at least anticipate getting a Johnson & Johnson EUA this week, that mm -hmm. we'll have um, a better inventory. And I think then those, yeah. those things will sort of relax just a little bit. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, what we know, even with these restrictions, uh, county by county or based on state of residency, is that doses are not sitting on shelves. So it's not slowing anything down for individuals. Um, or, or really slowing the population. And, and that, I think, is the end goal. Right now, when we don't have enough doses for everyone who wants one, um, there are limitations one way or another, and, and I hope soon that we'll be out of that situation. Yeah, I, I think so, and I agree. I th you know, we've seen evolution in this where the first allocations were to uh, health systems, you know, dictated by the state health department, um, and now it's more of the county health departments, but I think there's gonna continue to be evolution just as you said, as supply increases, especially if J&J &J does get approved, that will help a lot. Uh, I have a media question that just came in from Channel 9 uh, from Donna. Uh, can we ask Dr. Key if they plan to vaccinate players or is that going to be up to each individual? Um, as it stands right now, uh, it's hard to say what's going to happen. I don't think that there's, there's not a plan in place uh, through Major League Baseball in terms of vaccinating the players. Um, I think the players at some point will probably get vaccinated. But obviously, um, you know, I think they're down the pecking order. 
um, as long as we do our thing in terms of social distance and everything that we've done to try to mitigate our risk here, I think there are more important people that need to be vaccinated first, uh, and then uh, we, we, we get to the players. So uh, there hasn't been a plan in place uh, in terms of MLB, um, and I know in our organization, obviously, people uh, who fit the criteria um, have been uh, vaccinated in terms of age and, and, and comorbidities and things of that nature. But um, other than that, there really hasn't been a plan in place yet. And also, Dr. Key, Isaac wants to know, um, as for the Royals, do you know if the team will request proof of either a vaccination or a recent negative COVID test in order for fans to enter the stadium? Do you know that information? I don't know that yet. Uh, I know uh, Nick Kenny, our head trainer, uh, has been in contact with people uh, at the city level. Um, I can certainly ask him that uh, in his conversations, but I have not heard that as of yet. One of the things we know in, in that regard is that the success of the sweet testing at Arrowhead um, is playing into the conversations about whether testing may be appropriate in other venues that have suites where you can't separate out groups of seats. And so I, I would not be surprised to see that in if the suites were to open at the K, um, that there would be some sort of testing or, or vaccination um, sort of proof policy. But I'm not so sure that it makes sense across the whole stadium for the large population if you can space seats out. So I wouldn't be surprised to see a little bit, but I would also be surprised if it were uh, everyone coming into the stadium sort of answer in, in the long run. Yeah, I think the nice thing about that is the K is outside. Yeah. You know, not, not the suites, but <clears throat> most of the seating, which is a nice thing. Which vaccine is safe for someone who has severe anaphylaxis? My reactions stem from food and environmental triggers. Yeah, you know, if you see an allergist, I would, I would talk with them. But, you know, the current guidance is that, that food allergies um, or environmental triggers really don't play a part in this. So uh, both of these vaccines are going to be safe. But, you know, for your individual health, uh, please talk with your, your medical provider about that. But overall, the guidance is really that you should still be, it should still be safe for you. What is the role of T cells in COVID-19 infection? I've read that even without antibodies, our mm -hmm. T cells can remember the viruses we've had. Mm -hmm. Does that offer protection against COVID-19? Yeah, we actually think um, T cells play a substantial role. T cells play a substantial role in our immune function in general. Um, you know, CD4 T cells, which help with immune um, signaling to signal with cytokines and things of that nature, and then CD8 cells. T cells generally, um, the way to think about it is either cell signaling, so releasing of cytokines and communication with other immune cells to really coordinate the immune response. And then you have the T cells that also kill um, cells that are infected with virus. So you're essentially shutting down viral protection, whereas the antibodies really help through the bloodstream to get the virus that is out in the, uh, the bloodstream to help prevent infection of further cells. So that is the, the two arms. T cells are extremely important. We know that even people with, um, who have recovered and have no antibodies that are detectable um, have that T cell response. And so it is thought to play a very, very important role um, in the, um, the immune function and getting over uh, COVID-19 because of that. So T cells are extremely important. And we have seen in the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines that they have looked at T cell responses. And you do get fairly good T cell responses uh, with those vaccines as well. So the, the translation there um, <laughs> from from immunologists to, to maybe the, the, the general public is, I think, tell me if you disagree, Dana, yeah. but that the immune system is complex. Yeah. And any single portion measuring its activity is not a marker of immunity. So we've talked about that a lot. Mm -hmm. Just measuring antibody levels is not enough to say whether you have immunity or you don't. Um, that there are T cell functions and memory B cell functions and a lot of other things that happen that result clinically in this response where our body says, hey, I've seen you before and you're not gonna infect me again. Yeah. Um, and those things all play together. And so, yes, T cells play an important part in that conversation. And we have proof that our vaccines are generating T cell responses mm -hmm. like natural yeah. infection or natural immunity would. And, and those are all good things. Yeah, 100%. You know, um, there you go. So we know we hit the half million death mark yeah. this week for COVID-19. 675,000 people, people were killed by the Spanish flu 
back in 1918. There were no vaccinations for the Spanish flu. What does that modeling show for total expected deaths by COVID-19 now that we have the vaccines? Yeah. Uh, again, lots of good questions in there. Some uh, are assumptions and unknown still. Uh, some we have a pretty good sense of what the impact will be. Um, you know, first, uh, I don't think that there's any real thought that we're not going to top that 675,000 number for deaths from COVID uh, from this pandemic. So that's the first sort of answer in there. Um, second, um, vaccines, and we've said this a lot, vaccines don't uh, prevent death, vaccination does. And so just simply the fact that we have two and hopefully three after today candidates, yeah. uh, vaccine candidates that, that are available, uh, as we all have learned, um, is something very different from vaccination of everyone who wants it, whether we're talking about people in the community who, um, who have risk factors, whether they be age or coexisting disease, or even as Dr. Key mentioned, the fact that at some point we will get to players uh, because it, it is important to do that since they're around so many people and it's such an important part of, uh, of, of sort of our culture, but that right now there are more important people. Um, or at least people who would benefit more as far as reducing their risk. So what does that mean when we understand how vaccines fit into modeling to see where we think we're going to land? Well, um, as of yesterday, uh, we're doing about 700,000 new, um, new vaccines, new first vaccines per week, which is actually down as we've had more second doses to give nationwide. Um, and at that rate, um, it's estimated now that we're looking in, uh, say, August, mid-August, before half of the population has a first dose, if things don't change. And sometime in mid to late February, before 90% would have the first dose, uh, which means the impact of vaccine on deaths is going to sort of ramp up over a long period. But the whole reason we focused on those who are more likely to die, not just more those who are more likely to have disease um, it, with, with early vaccination, right? Those that live in long-term care facilities, those over 65, the, the odds ratios of death from infection are much higher for those groups. That's the reason to focus on them. Uh, even over those with comorbid conditions, for the most part, there are some things that I think have a high odds ratio as well, some very specific diseases. But that's, that's all going to say, the vaccination strategy has been aimed at blunting the, the deaths of those who are most likely to die early on. So a big portion of that benefit in the modeling happens now, we're seeing it already. We're seeing that in hospitalizations even, mm -hmm. I think, right? We've mentioned we don't see the hospitalizations from long-term care facilities, which were a big part of our early on uh, deaths anymore. We're not seeing that nearly the same way we were um, even a couple months ago. So. Long-winded answer is saying, of course, there's an impact. Um, it varies over time. It will continue to grow, um, but it's not going to be a big enough impact fast enough to keep us from hitting that 675,000 number. And a couple things, you know, those deaths from uh, the influenza in 1918, which again, I think it was more than just one calendar year. Yes. Also, a large proportion of those deaths were due to probably bacterial pneumonia, which occurred after influenza where we didn't have antibacterials. We have good antibacterials now to help prevent that. But when you say, um, you know, it's going to be this date or this date till first dose, does that include Johnson & Johnson, which potentially is that one dose series? So that, that is if we continue with the same okay. number of first doses per week that we're seeing okay. now. So yes, any, any change either in vaccination administration schedules, a single yeah. dose or a change to the existing or um, any new inventory coming okay. in because of another uh, authorization hopefully will change a, that. And a improve. positive effect, yeah. hopefully. Okay. A question for Dr. Key. What precautions do you recommend for youth baseball and high school baseball mm. and other sports as they start back up this spring? Um, I think, again, I, I think the main thing is doing a lot of the things that we've been doing before. I mean, it's kind of hard sometimes at a, uh, a, a baseball game because there's stands and things like that and people are standing around and especially at the youth baseball games. But again, it's, it's a matter of the same stuff, social distancing, wearing your mask, you know, if you had hand sanitizer with you, uh, using that, 
um, being able to pack. I know a lot of, of uh, parents like to bring snacks and things of that nature, uh, which is fine, but you're gonna, it's, it's gonna be a little bit more cumbersome because you have to individualize those things. Same way uh, that we do down here in Arizona is that our meals are packaged totally individually. Um, so I, I think those are the things uh, that we need to do. It may even be that kids limit uh, the number of games that they play during the summer, not going to as many tournaments. Um, at least for this summer, um, that may be something that needs to be done. Um, so I think those are the little things that we can do uh, to help uh, mitigate our risk. And I would add, you know, the biggest things I see is if you can get everybody in that dugout to mask, I think is important. Um, you know, because yep. they're just centered together so closely, coaches and, and players. Any advice for those of us who are primary caregivers who are unvaccinated to our elderly vaccinated parents? The continued stress and fear of giving them COVID-19 is starting to take a toll. Yeah. Well, you know, I know that uh, we have very good efficacy in these vaccines. And what I mean by efficacy here is, again, prevention of severe disease and mortality. I think if there's still concern, uh, if you are masking before the vaccination, I think masking is extremely important. Keeping that distance until you need to be close to them uh, to, to perform any functions or, or what that might be. But I think doing those things is really going to be the most helpful thing. Yeah, as we said over and over and over again, we knew how to prevent. Yeah transmission of COVID before vaccine. Vaccine is a tool that we have available to us and a very important one, but even in a circumstance where people are unvaccinated, we know that physical distancing and masking and good hand hygiene and all of the those pillars of infection prevention that we've talked about now for a year mm -hmm. um, play a part still. And so you can keep your family safe. Totally understand though the concern, the, the fear um, uh, and, uh, and, and don't uh, discount that at all. I read that the mortality rate in the ICUs between March and October of last year went from 60% to 36%. Is that because of a change in the virus or in treatments? And what can we expect from the new variants? Loaded questions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll start because you ha you've had a very good answer and explanation for the non um, for the non pharmaceutical reasons. So certainly for pharmaceutical reasons, we we do understand. Um, you know, remdesivir has helped. Uh, dexamethasone has helped. There's just been a new uh, study, the recovery study that was um, final analysis published in the New England Journal of Medicine either yesterday or today that shows an improved mortality rate for those people that meet that criteria for uh, steroid therapy, dexamethasone. And then, of course, the anticoagulation, helping prevent or treat those blood clots, either large blood clots or micro blood, blood clots that may occur in your lungs. So those drugs have certainly helped uh, but also I think uh, one of the things is also initially there was a big push to intubate people as soon as possible, get them on the ventilator as soon as possible. That theory, that thinking has changed. Now we're trying to prevent getting on the ventilator as much as possible until the last possible second and just using non-invasive ventilation, which is basically high amounts of oxygen through an oxygen mask. And then you had other um, reasons that... Yeah, there are a lot of reasons, I think. But what, what you're saying, Dana, that we learned a yeah. lot in our treatment... Um, is very true. Uh, just like we learned a lot about how to prevent spread. Mm -hmm. uh, you really watch this unfold, how rapidly we learned about a completely novel, I mean, remember we talked about this early on for a novel coronavirus, a disease yeah. that we as, um, uh, as a world had never seen before. We learned very rapidly how to keep it from, from in, uh, you know, being transmitted and, and then learned after that how to manage treatment. Um, and, and those things are very true. You know, the, one of the questions uh, I think that was, was buried in there was, is there a change in the virus? And I think we can say, well, mm -hmm. no, the virus is no less likely to cause disease or no less deadly than it was. We just know more about how to prevent spread yeah. and know more about how to treat. Um, and preventing spread to those who are more likely to die is one of the reasons that we have a lower mortality rate. And then improvement in treatment is another. And then one of the references you've mentioned before was talking about it's not an overwhelming of our health care system that has helped. Very true. Our nurses, respiratory therapists, physicians are not as overwhelmed right now and became less overwhelmed as the pandemic went on, especially here uh, locally than it was. But as you've talked about, those places where they are overwhelmed and there's capacity issues and there's lack of important drugs to keep people sedated and comfortable on the vent. 
then you also have a, a, a raise in your mortality rate as well. As far as is, are the variants more deadly? There's been some information out about the UK variant being more deadly, possibly um, the South African variant. Uh, you know, in the scientific community, virologists, you know, still want to see the full subset of data. We still don't know that for sure, but that is certainly what's being touted out there. Is there's a probably a, a higher risk of mortality from some of these uh, variants, um, about a third, probably 1.3 uh, percent, 1.3 uh, risk uh, from from the normal variant. But now we have some New York variants that we've seen talk about and some California variants. And I haven't seen a lot of information about increased mortality from those. So again, we are still waiting for the, for the full data on any change in mortality or the burden of disease with those. If the vaccines result in more asymptomatic or less symptomatic cases, will contact tracing still occur? Is there still a reason for the public to know where the outbreaks happen in the future? I think we'll have to start with saying until the majority of the population is vaccinated, there will still be a need for contact tracing. Um, and, and we will still need to talk about where we are seeing transmission to make sure that those that are unvaccinated, because remember, the, the thought is right now with no approved vaccine for children under 16, it will be some time before we're really even talking about vaccinating children. So we're going to have a lot of reason to pay attention to where disease spreads for, for, for a, a long time still. Um, that, that need isn't going to go away. But I think we are anticipating better guidance from the CDC on how to manage things for those who are vaccinated and for how long after a vaccine you don't need to worry about exposure as far as a risk of a significant risk of transmission. Yeah, but I, I think contact tracing and, and um, looking and identifying outbreak situations are extremely important, especially if you have congregate living situations like nursing facilities or prisons. Um, but then also I think the local dynamics in your community, uh, you know, if there's high rates of spread in a certain community, does that mean we can't go to the K and, and watch the Royals? I don't know. So I think contact tracing and the ability to identify surges or outbreaks is going to still be extremely important moving forward. I've read that long haulers have received some relief from their ongoing symptoms after getting vaccinated. Is this true? Um, yeah, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. I, I don't see a mechanism for that. I, that would be great. We know that, um, you know, COVID-19 long haulers or long COVID, and now it's called post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 or, or PASC, P-A-S-C. Um, people suffer brain fog, fatigue, shortness of breath. Um, uh, but, but I'm not aware of anybody who has had improvement after vaccination. But certainly, if you've had COVID-19, we do recommend that you still go get your vaccination. When will the vaccine receive full FDA approval instead of emergency use authorization approval? What will that really mean? Well, as far as when, uh, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, the, the process looks very different for mm -hmm. full approval than, than an application for an EUA. So yeah. um, a lot more goes into it um, for controlled studies for use in pregnancy, which I know we've talked about. Those, are, those studies are happening now. Uh, also understanding if there'd be a, an application for children. And again, for most vaccines, there are. So those studies would have to be done. Um, and a, a larger long-term safety profile. Mm -hmm. So we know the safety yeah. profile in the short term. And we believe uh, from everything we've seen that there really is no uh, safety risk with any of these vaccines that have EUA. But, but we'll want to know that in large populations and for longer than mm -hmm. three or four months of follow-up. So those things have to happen yeah. first. Timing yeah. is hard to know. Yeah, I don't think there's any set time frame. And, but once that does happen, when and if there is approval, then we can start talking about um, questions that have arisen. When are you going to make health care workers? When is it going to be mandatory? Well, we have to understand that influenza vaccination is mandatory, but that is an approved vaccine. So once that happens, um, then we can start to talk about employers. And there was a question today about the Royals and having their players vaccinated. So I think once there is approval, which, uh, you know, Dr. Wild had just said, we don't know exactly when that'll be. But once there is approval, then you will start to see employers start talking about possible mandatory vaccination at that point. Can I sneak in a couple extra questions that came in this morning? Sure. Okay, so Janet wants to know if you would know, why did the Missouri COVID vaccine form ask if I had received any other vaccinations re recently? Are there any known mm -hmm. interactions? Mm -hmm. She's considering getting the shingles vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so there is guidance um, that has come out from the CDC about you want to space your 
any other vaccination from the COVID-19 vaccination uh, by two weeks. So if you get one, uh, say shingles, don't get the other one, don't get COVID-19 for two weeks, or if you get COVID-19 vaccine, spread it out for two weeks. There's no good um, real data to support as to why. Uh, but again, the safety and efficacy of you know, giving those vaccines so close together is unknown. It's probably safe. I know that we've had to do that in a few instances here at the health system when people have recently got a vaccine. Um, a couple days later, they did get the uh, Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. They did fine, but currently the guidance is just if you can, try and space any other vaccine apart from COVID vaccine by two weeks. But we know that with other vaccines, for instance, when I see liver transplant uh, patients in my clinic when they're getting evaluated, we certainly give uh, two, three, sometimes four vaccines on the same visit. Um, so that can happen with other vaccines. It is perfectly safe. Again, this just so novel with Moderna and Pfizer right now, um, but that is the guidance. One last question. Renee wants to know um, when someone in their mid 40s in Johnson County might reasonably expect to get vaccinated. Do you know the magic <laughs> answer? Well, mid 40s uh, in Johnson County are, are based on really the Kansas plan anywhere. I would um, say if I had to bet summertime, um, when that will really be sort of open season for, for someone in that sort of age group and without significant comorbidities, uh, assuming of course that, right, you're not in uh, an in, in industry or an occupation that would allow you to get vaccinated in an earlier phase. So the example we've used regularly there is the focus on K to 12 educators now to be able to maintain um, the school systems. Uh, that, that's a sort of a new, newer population of people who hadn't been really focusing on can I get it now and there are some questions. But in general, I think um, I would say I'd, I'd plan on some time in the summer, not not yet this spring. All right. All right. Well, thanks for a, a great series of questions today. On Monday, James Stowe with the Mid-America Regional Council and Jana Jackson, our call center manager here at the health system, explain how those of you who uh, lack computer skills or hardware uh, can get in line to get the vaccine. Bring your questions and have a pen and paper ready for the resources that we'll share. As we wrap up today, Dr. Key, any final thoughts? Hey, I think this season is going to be a great season for us. Um, like I said, I think people are going to be excited. Um, we're excited on the other side with the we've been with the with the Chiefs. I think now it's time for us to bounce back. We had a good season last season, rolling into the off season, and uh, I really think that again we're going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, we have a tough division. Uh, but we're going to surprise a lot of people, and we're going to be really competitive this year. Yeah. Yeah. Dana? You know, stay safe, Vince, and look forward to you and, and Joe and Nick keeping all the Royals safe and getting them back uh, so we can hopefully everybody can get out to the K and see them. You know, the weather is going to be nice this weekend, especially Saturday, so I'm sure people are not going to be bundled up at home anymore. If you can get outside, get outside and get some activity, but please, if you, other, if you otherwise go places, um, eat eating, uh, restaurants, any place like that, please continue to do those measures of infection prevention that we always talk about. Distance, wear your mask, um, you know, try not to uh, mix your bubbles uh, because we know that we want to keep uh, our restaurants open and everybody in work, but we, we can do this in a thoughtful manner and keep everybody safe doing it. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Dana. You know, um, I'm excited actually uh, for really had in for the first time because main, mainly because we've had time to think about it a little bit but excited for baseball season um i miss uh sitting in the sun on the first base side um uh sometimes sometimes it's a hot uh, hot seat but um i've enjoyed uh, really my whole time in kansas city being able to go every year uh in the springtime to the k and uh, i'm hopeful as you mentioned that if we continue as a community to, to do the things that we know how to do the, the things that we've done so well uh, really throughout the last year that we can uh, continue to open things up, maybe not exactly in the ways that they were before all of this, but open things up and, and enjoy them. And I hope that means a, a nice safe trip to the K sometime here this spring. Vince, take care out there uh, in surprise. Have a good time while you're there, but be safe. And 
wish the same to everyone here as, as you said, Dana, as we enjoy the nice weather here this weekend. We will see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>